Good morning, church. Can you all hear me? All right. Thank you, Anita, for reading the verse today. Um, I'm so glad to be in the house of God this morning. Um, as always, I'm glad that it's Youth Sunday. Um, as Betsy mentioned, um, Youth Sunday is a, uh, is a day that we set aside uh, to have our youth take the reins. Uh, we believe here at ICF that they are the next generation. We believe that in a few years, if the Lord tarries, that they're going to be the ones who are um, praising and worshiping, um, working on the tech team in the back, uh, preaching up here. So um, when our knees go out and our hips are bad, um, they will be the ones to step up. So I thank and praise God for all of our children, all of our youth, and, and the talents that God has given them. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, um, and if you're not there already, please turn with me to Psalm 119. Uh, these are the verses that Anita just, Anita just read. And uh, if you haven't guessed by now, the theme for today is the Bible, uh, the scripture, the word of God. And if I were to title my talk, um, it would go like this, four things you should know about the Bible, four things that you should know about the Bible. And we're going to use the verses that we read here in Psalm 119 as, as sort of a jumping point to... Um, distill uh, what God is telling us about his word and through his word. So four things that you should know about the Bible. And before I begin, I should say that this is a very broad topic, and I wanted to distill it down to some essentials, but also keeping in mind that this is Youth Sunday, so we are speaking primarily to the youth and our Sunday school children, but as always, uh, we remind you who are adults and maybe who are not so young that you should always listen because the Bible says of itself in Isaiah 55 that when God's word goes out, it does not return empty, it does not return void. So God's word will accomplish the purpose that God has for it. So whether you're young or old, I hope you are sitting here expectantly because God has a word for you today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. So there's a couple of things that I want to tell you about the Bible, and I want to uh, share it in about four points. So if you leave here today and remember nothing else, just remember the four points that we're going to share about the Bible, these four things, okay? And the first thing I want you to know that everybody should know is that the Bible is God's word. The Bible is God's word. And I know some of you are sitting there, duh, noble uncle, I know that already, God's word is God's word. But I wanted to expand on that, and I want you to understand what it means when we say that the Bible is the word of God. Sometimes as Christians, we use phrases so often that it becomes meaning to, meaningless to us, right? It becomes a cliche. We say it so often that we forget what it means. Uh, so when we say that the Bible is the word of God, we mean quite that, exactly that. When I was growing up, uh, I grew up in a church environment and among people that used to talk a lot about hearing from God. And I really loved it when someone would get up in church and share their testimony, or someone would get up in a prayer meeting and say, I heard from God, I heard from God. God spoke to me last night, or God spoke to me this morning, or God spoke to me today in the prayer. And what are the different ways that God spoke to them? Well, some people had dreams. They were sleeping in the night, and they had a dream like we all do, but this dream was uh, very special because it was God speaking to them in the dream, and God told them to buy a car or build a building or whatever it was, and they would come and share it with us, and we were all excited because God spoke to that person in a dream. Other, purple, uh, other people heard through prophets. We would have prophets come, or they would go somewhere, and a prophet, a man of God, would come, and, and they would say, oh, God is speaking to me. God is telling me to do this. God is telling me that you should go here, or do that, or buy this, or sell that. And it was very exciting to hear a word of prophecy. And as a child, I, I really loved uh, listening to people give a word from God. It was really exciting. We would pause the meeting, and everybody would stop, and somebody would get up and say, God just spoke to me, and this is the word I have for you, or this is the word I have for the church. And it was really exciting. And then, of course, the most exciting, the most amazing way that God spoke uh, to these people were through visions, right? Somebody would speak about the vision that they had. They were fasting and praying, or they were sitting somewhere. They were sitting on the bus or on the subway, and all of a sudden they saw God, uh, or they saw an angel giving uh, a message from God, or they heard an audible voice from God. And this was all amazing to me as a child. And for many years, I went through uh, seasons of life saying, God, God, 
why don't you speak to me? I want to hear from you. So I cannot tell you the countless number of nights that I would sit and I would pray. I say, God, come to me in a vision. God, speak to me audibly so I can hear you. I would sit in prayer meetings and in churches and I would say, God, give me a word. There was a prophet walking around, uh, going to people seemingly at random, giving them a word. And I would say, God, give me the word. God, give me the word. And I cannot tell you how many times I was disappointed because I did not get a word. I did not get a vision. I did not get a dream that I felt was from God. But here's the thing that I want to tell all of you right now. Yes, God does speak through prophets. Yes, God does speak through dreams. Yes, God does sometimes come to us in visions. But I want you to know something. Every young person here today, I want you to know something. God speaks to us through his word. God speaks to us through the Bible. When you are reading the Bible, when you are reading the words on this page, that is God speaking to you. And it is just as valid as a dream that is sent by God. It is just as valid as a word of prophecy. It is just as valid as a vision that you get. God speaks to us through the word. So that is the first thing I need you to understand, that the Bible is the word of God. It is God speaking to you. The Bible tells us that God does speak to us in different ways. Uh, The Bible tells us that God speaks to us through nature or through creation. In Psalm 19, very famous verse you you should all know, Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And what the Bible is telling us there is that you don't need the Bible, you don't need anyone else to tell you that God exists. Why? Because nature itself creation itself declares the glory of God. So if you are an atheist, if you've never heard of the Bible, you will still know that a God exists because God's fingerprints are on creation. That's what the Bible says of creation, of nature. So God speaks to us uh, to a certain extent through creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, God speaks to us through the speech of human lips, uh, through prophets or pastors or teachers. When they share the word of God, when they're giving you a Sunday school lesson, when they're leading in youth group, that is God speaking through people, through humans. Uh, God does speak uh, through other manifestations. I am not a cessationist. I don't believe that God stopped talking 2,000 years ago. There are some Christians who go around saying, no, there is no audible voice of God, there is no word of prophecy. We don't believe that here. Uh, We do believe that God sometimes does speak to us uh, through visions, through prophecy. But the point that I'm trying to make is, and what many people don't realize is, that God primarily speaks through his word. When you read the word of God, when you are delving into scripture, that is God speaking to you. Don't discount it. Don't say that's not as good as a prophecy. Don't say I want to see a vision or I want to hear the voice of God. God is speaking through you to you through the Bible. Okay, um, in Psalm 19, uh, uh, there are a number of euphemisms here for the Word of God and the Bible, but they all refer to God and His Word. God speaking to us. In verse 1, it says, the law of the Lord. That's God's word. Uh, Verse 2 refers to his statutes. Verse 3 says, follow his ways. Uh, Verse 4 talks about God laying down precepts. Verse 5 and 8 talks about the decrees of God. Verse 6 in Psalm 119 talks about the commands of God. Verse 7 talks about his righteous laws. These, these are all different ways that God speaks to us. And the psalmist is enumerating them. He's going through all of them. God is speaking to us through his word, through his law, his statutes, his commands, his decrees. Don't discount when God speaks to you through his word. When we read the Bible, God is speaking to us. There's a famous verse from the second epistle of Timothy, Timothy 2. Uh, chapter 3, 15 to 17. You guys all know this section of scripture, but I will read it for you. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 15, 16, 17. Okay. Uh, From infancy, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We're going to go into the rest of that uh, scripture later, but the emphasis that I wanted to make was that Paul is saying to Timothy, all scripture, 
all of the Bible, all of the Word of God is God-breathed. It means that God uh, spoke into the Word. He spoke through various people. He spoke through all of the books. And every line of Scripture, every single word, every dot on every I, every cross on every T is there because God breathed it into Scripture. Amen? There is not a single word in Scripture that is there without God allowing it. God breathed into Scripture. One thing we should be careful is we should not confuse the Bible with God. The Bible is not itself God. The Bible is just a book. It's some pages bound together. Uh, when I was a kid and I used to attend Mass, I would see the priest uh, take the Bible and he would kiss it and he would genuflect, he would bow before it and he would raise it up and he would do all sorts of things. Uh, the problem is uh, we get into a gray area. Uh, we're treating the Bible as if it is God. Here at ICF, we don't teach that the Bible is God. This, is, this object is not God. But in another sense, the Bible is the word of God. It's God speaking to us through this book. So we revere the Bible. We give it reverence. We give it a, a place of central importance here in our church, here in, uh, in our youth group, in our families, because the Bible is God speaking to us, okay? So the Bible is not God. The Bible is God speaking to us. So the authority of the Bible is the authority of God. If you disobey the Bible, you're disobeying God. If you obey the word of God, you're obeying God. Does everybody understand that? Everybody understand that? And if you disobey the word of God, you are disobeying God, and that is serious sin and brings judgment from God. I know a lot of Christians, especially young people, that say, well, I don't care about that portion of scripture. I've had many kids say that to me. I don't care about that section or I don't care about that word. But what you have to understand is God is speaking to you through his entire word. Every section, every book, every uh, uh, chapter that speaks to your situation, that is God speaking to you. You don't get to pick and choose. You do not get to pick and choose based on your situation. Deuteronomy 18, 19 says like this, Deuteronomy 18, 19, I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. God was talking about his scripture that he was ascending through the prophets and God said, I will call you to account if you don't obey the word that I have given you. So be aware of that. The Bible itself is not God, but the Bible is the word of God and you obey or disobey at the risk of obeying or disobeying God himself. The other thing I want to mention when I say that the Bible is the word of God, and the video you saw kind of touched upon it, is that the Bible, uh, God used different people to write the Bible. God used different people to write the Bible. And I believe the video referred to as a Bible is a book that is composed as a series of books. Um, the narrator said that the Bible is a bunch of different books bound together as one book. And that's a very good description for the Bible. Every book in the Bible is more or less written by a separate person, and it's bound together. And there are different kinds of books in there. There are stories in there. There are letters in there. There are books of, full of law and law giving. There are poems and there are songs, different books, uh, different senses, but they all come together and they all had different authors and some were very good at writing. Some had really good Greek, i.e. Paul. It said that Paul had the equivalent of 10 PhDs and so everybody says his Greek is really good, but some people had much coarser language, i.e. Peter. He was a fisherman. So when you read the epistle of Peter, for those of you who know your Greek or Koine Greek is, ah, oh, this is terrible Greek because people, uh, Peter was not that educated. And that's okay because it all came from God. God used the education of the people who were writing down scripture. He used their different literary styles. He used their grammar, their vocabulary, their diction. He used their education to write down in their words uh, the scripture, but you must understand that it all came from God. It was all inspired by God. It was all God breathed, okay? So the verse that tells us this is 2 Peter 1.21. 2 Peter 1.21 says like this, for prophecy, the word of God, never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
That is, in essence, what Timothy was saying, uh, what Paul was saying to Timothy, that all scripture is God-breathed. So it did not have its origin in the human authors, but God inspired them. The Holy Spirit breathed into that scripture as they were writing. So all of scripture, even though it is different books written over the course of several thousand years, different literary styles, different authors, all came from God. So essentially, that is the point I want to make. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible is God speaking to you. God used many different people, many different authors, many different times, but it was all under the inspiration of God. The second point I want to make, the second point I want to make, first is that the Bible is God's word. The second point I want to make, and I tried to find another word because I didn't want to use this expensive word, but there really wasn't a word that fit. The second point that I want to make is that the Bible is inerrant. The Bible is inerrant. And you should know about the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, first, let's define what it means to be inerrant. The Bible is inerrant. When we say that the Bible is inerrant, we mean that the Bible is free from error. There are no mistakes in the Bible. The Bible is infallible. It is absolutely trustworthy. It is absolutely sure. The Bible is inerrant. You must understand that. That's the second thing you must know about the Bible. The Bible is inerrant. There are no mistakes in Scripture. There are no errors. There is nothing that is applicable and within a certain context only for those people. We can get out of Scripture. Yes, there is a contextual reading of Scripture, but the Bible is always applicable to us at all times. The Bible says God gave us those people, those stories as an example to us. Psalm 119, uh, verse 7, uh, that we read earlier, says like this, I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. Psalm 119, verse 86, says all your commands are trustworthy. The psalmist is saying, God, there is no flaw in your scripture. There are no mistakes. There is no error. There is no uh, uh, um, uh, things that were uh, out of place. Scripture is without error. Scripture is without mistakes. Scripture is perfect. It is righteous. It is trustworthy. There is a question I get asked often. I've, I've been asked uh, from the time I was in college um, up until this present day um, from people who are not Christians or, or, or vacillating on the fence about their faith. And, and the question they often ask me is, do you believe that the Bible is literal? Do you believe that the Bible is literally true? And this is after some time that, that I share my faith with them or they happen to know I'm a, I'm a Christian. And uh, I've been posed this question at least two dozen times from various people, roommates in college, classmates, coworkers. Um, uh, and they ask me, do you really believe in the Bible? Do you believe what it says? Do you believe that the Bible is literal? Oftentimes, they're usually asking about something like, um, you know, the six-day creation versus what science says or whatever it is. And I've discovered that really don't argue with these people. Um, you won't convince them whatever it is that the Bible teaches. Most of the time, you won't convince them. Um, it's, it's good for debate, but not for the purpose of evangelism. But it is a good question. It is a good question. Is the Bible literal? Is the Bible without error? And many Christians actually say no. I know a lot of Christians who otherwise uh, on the surface seem like good born-again Christians who believe everything you and I believe. But then when you talk to them or you find out um, a, a sermon they gave or some podcast or some interview that they don't believe that the Bible uh, is without error. Uh, they believe that there are mistakes in Scripture and so they believe there are sections you can ignore or are not applicable to us today. Uh, uh, they say that Bible is a good book and you should follow the teachings, be good and do good and Jesus was good and we should all be good and everything is good. And my answer to them is that the Bible, this book, is the word of God. This book is without error. It is inerrant and that is the entire Bible. That is the entire book. There is not one word that has an error in it because all scripture is God breathes. Why is this so important? Why do we emphasize this so much 
Because when the enemy attacks, when the enemy attacks your faith, the very first thing that he will do is that he will attack the scripture. He will say that this is not valid. He will say that this is not a true. And then everything else, that's the foundation, it will crumble. If you take a house and if the foundation is crumbling, you really can't save the house. If the walls are bad or the windows are broken or the roof is leaking, you can fix the house. But if the foundation is crumbling, there's really nothing you can do to save a house whose foundation is being destroyed. That is the base of the whole thing. And in the same way, our faith is based on the Bible. That is our foundation. So that when the enemy comes to attack you, the first thing he will do in your high school or college classroom, the first thing he will do in the work or workplace, in the marketplace, is to attack the inerrancy of scripture. Many years ago, I think in the early 2000s, um, there was a church um, that came out and announced um, something quite shocking. And uh, most Christians were quite shocked. Uh, don't really need to go into the details, but everybody's like, how can this church, how can this denomination do this? How can they uh, turn their back on God? And the thing was that in the early 2000s, to me, that was not surprising. It was not surprising that this church turned its back on God. Do you know why? Because 40 years earlier, in the 1960s, that same church had come out and said that the Bible has mistakes in it. The Bible is not inerrant. And so they had turned away from the doctrine of inerrancy. And so what I told everybody when that announcement was made, I think in 2005 or whatever it was, that don't be surprised. What you are seeing is the fruit. That's just the fruit. You shouldn't be surprised. What was planted was planted 40 years earlier. And that seed was the refutation, uh, the, the rejection of the doctrine of inerrancy. And when you reject that the Bible is inerrant, all sorts of uh, problems creep in. So I was never surprised when that church announced uh, uh, that thing because they had rejected the Bible 40 years earlier. This is so important. It is so important to accept the inerrancy of scripture. Why is that? I'm gonna go back to the earlier point that we mentioned that God revealed himself in various ways. We talked about God revealing himself through nature and creation. We talked about God revealing himself through various people, pastors, Sunday school teachers, and prophets. We uh, talked about God revealing himself through audible and uh, 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 visions uh, that you could see and hear. We talked about God, uh, we will talk about God revealing himself through the person of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing I want to say. In and of themselves, these things are all, in a sense, unreliable and limited, right? Uh, you can say that nature talks about God, but what does it say exactly about God? You don't know. You can't tell that from creation alone. You can say that a prophet or a pastor or a teacher uh, is teaching from God, but how do you know that outside of the Bible? What do you compare that with? You can say that, oh, I heard a voice from God and God told me to do this. God told me to go and uh, you know, sell a car or buy a car or talk to this person. But how do you know that? You can talk about Jesus Christ, but outside of the Bible, how do you know about him? What do you know about him? I have relatives that believe that Jesus went to India and did great, great many miracles in India. How do I know that? Because I was at their house for Christmas once and I looked in their bookshelf and a book said Jesus in India. And I said, did Jesus go to India? They believed that, right? So all of these things outside of the Bible are unreliable. They are limited. But how do you know what nature is saying? How do you know what, that Jesus existed and what he taught? How do you know that was God really speaking to you? It is unreliable. But God reveals himself through the word, and the word of God is reliable. It is of utmost importance that you understand this, that all of those other things, the stories about Jesus, the, the visions and the prophecies and the lessons and the sermons that you hear, in and of themselves are unreliable outside of the Bible, if you separate them from the Bible. God reveals himself through his written word. God reveals himself through his written word. I'm going to go through a couple of scripture that talks about that. Uh, first one comes from Exodus 31, Exodus 31, 18. Uh, Moses is given two tablets of stone. Uh, you all know about that. You all know the story written by God. So Exodus 31, 18 says like this, when the Lord finished his speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inspired by the finger of God. So God gives Moses the law, but he didn't tell Moses the law. He wrote it down himself on those two tablets. God gave Moses the written word. That's important to understand. 
Uh, later on in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 31.26, it says like this, Deuteronomy 31.26, Moses gives that law to the Israelites, and when he gives it to them, he says something very important. Don't miss it. There it will remain as a witness against you. Uh, Moses is referring to the law, the written law that God gave him. And when he gives it to the Israelites, when he gives that law to the people, he says, there it will remain as a witness against you. Why? Because the written word of God is reliable. It is a reliable witness. More verses. Joshua 24, 26. Joshua chapter 24, verse 26. Joshua records these things in the book of God, God's decrees and laws that God had given Joshua. He writes them down. He writes these things in the book of down. He didn't memorize them and tell the, the other people to memorize them. He wrote them down. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 2. It says like this. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. God places an importance upon the written word of God. What Kathy Chechi referred to as the logos, the written word of God. God places a divine and utmost importance on the written word of God. Why? Because it is reliable. It is the reliable word of God. In Isaiah 38, it says like this. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8. Highlight this, underline this in your Bible. Go now, write it on a tablet for them, inscribe it on a scroll, that for the days to come it may be a, what? An everlasting witness. The word of God written down is an everlasting witness. God's logos, God's logos word is an everlasting witness of God to the people. It is an accurate preservation of God's word for subsequent generations. It gives you opportunity for repeated inspection. You can go look at it again and again and trust that it's reliable. If I told you to do something, if I gave you 10 instructions, everybody, anybody ever play that game of telephone or Chinese whispers, whatever it's called, right? You get everybody in a circle and one person whispers to the other. And by the time you get 10 or 15 people down, the message has completely changed. It is completely garbled. If it makes any sense at all, it, it is completely different from the original message. Why? Because the unwritten word, the spoken word, is unreliable. People change things. It can get uh, uh, misconstrued. And as it goes over time to various people, it changes. But what does God say about his own word, that his written word, that it is an everlasting witness? It's an accurate preservation of God's word for subsequent generations. You can repeatedly inspect it. You can go to that same word and look at it over and over again. You can study it. It allows for careful study and discussion. When we come together in our Bible study, when we come together in our Sunday school, in our youth group, when we come together here on a Sunday morning, we are looking to the word. We don't say, I think God told me this and God gave me a vision and this prophet told me this. No, we start with the word of God. It is accessible to everybody. It is reliable. It is permanent. It is accessible. Everybody should be coming to church with a Bible. That is why we carry our Bibles with us. We don't trust the person who is standing here. You should not trust me because I am standing here and speaking from the pulpit. Neither should you trust Pastor Alex or anyone who stands here giving you a message. Rather, we are judged by the standard of the Word of God. Does everybody understand that? As long as we are faithfully and accurately relaying what God's word says to you in the Bible, then we are faithful witnesses to God. But as soon as we deviate from the Bible, we have gone off script. We are not speaking on behalf of God. So don't just trust anyone who stands in a pulpit just because they give you a message, just because they gave you a word. Uh, you must go to the word of God. Scripture indicates the total truthful, truthfulness and reliability of God's word. Scripture itself talks about how truthful and reliable God's word is. And I'll give you again a couple of verses of scripture. Uh, Psalm 12, verses 6. Psalm 12, verses 6 says like this, The words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. It's talking about the purity of scripture. Again, there are no mistakes in it. It's flawless, like gold coming out of a crucible. Uh, Proverbs 30, verse 5. Proverbs 30, verse 5. I love this verse because the church I grew up in in, in New York City in Queens, um, it was an Italian church, and um, the Indian church bought it, I guess, in the 70s. And the people who built that church, they were Italian immigrants from Italy, 
and they had a Bible up on top of the church at the top near the steeple. It was about three foot high and yay wide, and Proverbs 30 verse 5 was on one side in English and the other side in Italian, and to this day I can recite this verse in old Italian, but Proverbs 30 verses 5, this is what I saw every week as a child sitting in church. Every word of God is flawless. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Talking about the reliability and truthfulness of scripture. And finally, in Numbers 23, 19, Numbers 23, 19, it says like this, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. When God speaks to us through his word, he never contradicts himself. God never changes what he says to us through his word. So you can test other things through his word. The inerrancy of scripture. The inerrancy of scripture. So that's the second point I wanted to make to you today, that the Bible, number one, is God's word, God speaking to you, and then the Bible is inerrant. I'm going to go a couple of more points into the inerrancy of scripture, and I'll go through this quickly because we're running out of time. Um, Basically, inerrancy means that the scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. So what that basically means in uh, logic terms is there is nothing in scripture that is contrary to known fact. There is nothing in scripture that contradicts fact. The Bible tells the truth, and it tells the tr tr truth concerning everything it talks about, okay? But the one thing you should know is the the Bible does not speak about every known fact in the universe. And I tell this often to our kids in our hawk's nest meetings. The Bible doesn't talk about everything. You will not find out how to program a computer in the Bible. You will not learn how to do open heart surgery in the Bible. Why? Because the Bible doesn't talk about every known fact in the universe. The Bible tells the truth concerning everything it does talk about, but it doesn't talk about everything, all right? You should understand that. The other thing I want to mention is sometimes um, people get tripped up in this. The Bible is inerrant, but it still uses everyday speech, okay? The Bible is inerrant, but it still uses everyday speech, okay? Uh, there's no scientific language in the Bible. Uh, the Bible talks about the sun rises and the rain falls, okay? We know scientifically the sun does not rise. We know scientifically uh, that that's not a thing. The earth is rotating, right? But the Bible is not using scientific language. The Bible is using everyday speech. So if I said to you, the sun rose today, you would know exactly what I mean. Even though sun, the sun itself did not rise, we're spinning on this rock, however fast we're going, and the sun is rotating around us, spinning around us. But you know what I mean when I say the sun rises. So the Bible uses everyday speech. It uses everyday speech when describing numbers, right? So if the Bible says 8,000 men uh, was killed in battle, it might be false to say that 16,000 died, but uh, not 7,832 or 8,115. We use everyday speech and we round numbers, right? We say 8,000 uh, even though it's 7,900 or 8,100. Everybody understand that? The Bible uses everyday speech. So just because the Bible uses everyday speech, everyday language, doesn't mean it's not inerrant. You should understand that because people will attack you with this. People will attack you. Uh, the Bible uses everyday speech when describing measurements, right? You can say uh, a number of things different ways. You can say, uh, we live uh, right here in Poway, so I can say something like, I don't live far from church. Or I can say, I live over one mile from church. Or I can say, I live about one mile from church. Or I can say, I live 1.34 miles from church, right? All of these things are true. So it's okay to be vague and imprecise. It's still true, okay? So the Bible does use everyday language, and that does not mean there are mistakes in the Bible, okay? Because I've heard people attack the Bible through that. A couple more things about inerrancy, okay? The Bible does use loose quotations, and that does not mean there are mistakes in the Bible. Or to put it another way, the Bible can be in inerrant and still use loose quotations. So let me explain that. In modern language, in the West, we use quotation marks, okay? In our culture, whenever we're quoting somebody, we'll use quotation marks. And when you read a, a portion of text in a newspaper or a magazine or something, and they say, oh, the president said, and you see quotation marks, what that means in English is the president said exactly this. His exact words were uh, written down, and they, we put them in quotation marks to represent the content of what that person said, okay? But here's the thing. Quotation marks are a new invention. They're a relatively modern thing, okay? So uh, in the Bible, where they didn't have quotation marks, all you have to do is have a correct representation of what the content of what the person says was. Everybody understand that? 
right? You don't need exact quotes. So if Pastor Alex says, um, you know, if I say, oh, Pastor Alex said he will be home for dinner soon, right? But Pastor Alex might have actually said, uh, I will be coming home uh, to the house for dinner in exactly 10 minutes, right? Am I contradicting what Pastor Alex said? No, I'm just quoting him, but using imprecise language. The Bible uses sometimes imprecise language or what the theologians call loose quotations. That does not mean the Bible is not inerrant, okay? So uh, be very careful for that. Um, I should probably mention this. There's a, there's a very f m famous modern scientist who goes around. Uh, anybody know Bill Nye, the science guy? Okay, so uh, there's a, a modern scientific rational humanist scientist who goes around and he loves to uh, talk about Mark 31, Mark 4:31, 31, right? Uh, where Jesus is talking about the mustard seed. He, he's gone around to a number of places and just by happenstance, I've, I've come across him saying this a number of times. In Mark 4:31, Jesus is talking about the mustard seed. He's actually talking about the kingdom of God. And the scientist goes around saying, Jesus said that the mustard seed was the smallest of all seeds. So then he goes around saying, look, we know today that the mustard seed is not the smallest of all seeds. So here is a contradiction. Here is a contradiction to fact. We know there are seeds that are much smaller. In fact, if you look at it scientifically, the mustard seed looks like a giant thing compared to those other seeds, right? So the scientist said, well, the Bible has a mistake, and that's the end of it. It's not true. Why? Because Jesus said the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. But here's the problem with that. Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God in that parable, in that section. And if he were to examine it, he would understand that he was talking about the kingdom of God and comparing it to a mustard seed. So he's talking about the kingdom of God. And he's speaking to an agrarian people. He's speaking to farmers in ancient Palestinian society. So he spoke to them what they would understand. And what he said was, he was trying to talk about the kingdom of God and how it started out very small, so he used a mustard seed. That's what they would understand. So probably an exact translation would be the smallest of all your seeds or something like that, right? The mustard seed is the smallest of all your seeds. The kingdom of heaven is like that, right? Uh, the comparison is to something small becoming something large, okay? Just because Jesus used that exact language or it's translated like that doesn't mean that that is a mistake. In fact, uh, later uh, the verse says it becomes the largest of all garden plants. I don't know if it's 31 or, or later, but Jesus says it becomes the largest of all garden plants. Now here's the thing. The people of that time knew that there were plants bigger than the mustard plant. You understand that? But they knew what he was talking about. They knew the language that he was using. So just because the Bible uses imprecise language, unscientific language, does not mean that there are mistakes in it. Okay, so um, I'll skip over, but I can say a couple of things. The Bible can be inerrant and still use unusual or loose grammatical construction. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, some parts of scripture are elegant and stylistically really well written, and other parts of scripture are rough and contain the language of the ordinary people, as with Peter. But here's the thing, the failure to uh, uh, um, uh, follow commonly accepted grammatical principles does not accept, uh, does not affect the truthfulness of the statement, okay? So let me say that again. Uh, if someone speaks with bad grammar, if someone writes something and misspells it, that does not affect necessarily the validity of what they are saying. So an, un, if you have a village and you have an uneducated village man there, he may be the most untrusted man in that village. Even though his grammar is poor, even though he might not know how to speak, he might have a reputation for never telling a lie. Does everybody understand? So poor grammar does not, does not affect the validity of the contents. So when someone says, oh, this Greek is really terrible or this Aramaic is all wrong, that does not mean the Bible has a mistake. That's how people write. Okay, so some other things about inerrancy that Bible, uh, people say the Bible is only authoritative for faith and practice. It's not infallible or inerrant. But uh, 2, Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, a verse we read says, all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is inerrant. So the entire Bible is without mistakes. Don't let anyone tell you, because I've heard that a lot from um, Christians. Uh, I went to someone who was a grad student when I was in school at the time, and I said, hey, hey man, you're doing something wrong. And I knew he was a Christian. He was an Orthodox Christian. I said, hey, I think you're doing something wrong. And he said, I don't believe that section. I don't believe what Paul wrote. So basically his answer to me was, I don't believe, I believe in the Bible, but I don't believe in that portion of the Bible. But that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says all scripture is God breathed. So there is no indication that any part of scripture is unreliable and cannot be relied on completely. So um, 
Uh, there are some translational issues, so I, I need to touch on this because I know the kids will um, go into this. Uh, when I was a kid, the controversy over the King James Bible was starting. It kind of took bloom about 15, 20 years ago and has since died down. But when I was a kid, everybody who went to an English church was supposed to use the King James Bible. And then they would go around picking up the NIV or the newer translation. They would say, what happened to this verse? Why is this so different? Why is this section missing? And the problem was they were saying either that there are mistakes in this translation or there are errors in the Bible. But what they don't understand is the Bible, God inspired the original manuscripts, those people who wrote in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. And the problem is we don't have those original manuscripts today. Uh, and if, if we did, we don't speak those languages. So by necessity, we do use translations. So sometimes there may be a mistake in the translation, but that does not mean that there is a mistake in the Bible. Does everybody understand? So if your journey group leader uh, or your Sunday school teacher or whoever is smart, they will use multiple translations. And sometimes they will go into the original manuscript. When we go to Bible study on Tuesday nights, uh, Dax and Uncle sometimes will stop and say, this in Greek says this, or in the Hebrew, this word means that. Why? Because sometimes translation is unclear, so we go to the original manuscript, so we go to the original language. And uh, just, um, I will quickly mention, because I don't want to uh, leave it, uh, while we don't have the original manuscripts, I should mention that we know for 99% of the Bible what the original manuscript says because we have many copies, and so we, or we can figure out from context, um, or the mistakes in translation are the mistakes of men, not the mistakes of God. I need to make that clear, and I'm, I'm sorry for belaboring the point, because as children, our kids, our youth will get these questions. They will get uh, people coming up to them and saying, this is a mistake in the Bible, so I need you to understand. So I'll close that point here. The Bible is inerrant. There are no mistakes in Scripture. Okay? Everybody understand? I'll end quickly. So the first thing we learned is that the Bible is the Word of God. It's God speaking to us. The second thing that we learned is the Bible is inerrant. There are no mistakes in Scripture. Scripture is completely perfect and infallible. The third thing I want to say to you is that the Bible is a standard. The Bible is a standard. That's the third point I want to make. The Bible is a standard. Um, going back to Psalm 119, verses 2 and 3, it says like this, Blessed are they who, uh, those who keep his, his statutes. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. Blessed are they who keep his statutes. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. Let me stop for an example, a uh, moment and give you an example. We bought a fridge um, a month, a year and a, some months ago. And before we bought the fridge, we weren't sure if the fridge would fit through our front door. So we looked online and we checked with the manufacturer and the manufacturer said, you know, the fridge was 32 inches. And then we went and checked and it turned out our door was 34 inches. So we knew that when we bought the fridge, it would fit in through the front door. Why? Because the inch is a standard. That word inch is a standard. When the manufacturer said that the fridge was 32 inches wide, we knew exactly what an inch meant. We had a tape measure and we knew that the inch that they were talking about was the same inch we were talking about. So we could use it to measure our door and we knew that the fridge would come in through the door because the inch is a standard. A standard is something that is considered by authority or consent as a basis for comparison. We can have the standard, and then we can compare the things to the standard. So the standard is the inch. So we can compare the fridge to the standard and say, ah, the fridge is 32 of these standards. Or we can compare the width of the door to the standard and say, ah, the width of the door is 34 of these standards. Everybody understand that? A standard is something that you can uh, compare everything else to, something considered by authority or consent as a basis for comparison. I referred a couple of times to people having visions, dreams, prophecies, hearing sermons, Sunday school lessons, Bible study lessons, all of those things. What I said, uh, what was left unsaid earlier is, all of those things could be wrong. Some of it could be wrong, all of it could be wrong. You don't know. So someone could come to you and say, I had a dream and God spoke to you. And the first thing you should ask, you should be naturally skeptics is, did God really speak to you? Uh, someone could come to you and say, ah, I'm a prophet and God told me to uh, tell you, I'll give $1,000 to this organization over there. And the first thing you should say is, well, uh, you should ask yourself at least, uh, maybe it's not polite to ask in person, is this person really speaking on behalf of God? 
uh, uh, visions, dreams, prophecies, sermons, they're all good. We're not saying that they don't exist. But I want to make it very clear that they can be wrong. So we, what do we do? We use God's word as a standard to measure everything else. We use God's word to measure the dream and the prophecy and the vision and the sermon and the Sunday school lesson and the Bible study uh, lesson, right? God's word is a standard. We use it to measure everything else, including what I am saying from this pulpit. We use God's word as a standard to measure those other things. Uh, I was at a friend's house 20 years ago, a couple of us had gone to his house. I think we were going to play some video games or something. And it just so happened that this friend of ours, he had a relative visiting for uh, him. And I did, we didn't know that until we got there. He had a relative visiting um, him in his apartment from out of town. And so we overlapped by, by about an hour. So I sat down and, and met my friend's cousin. And I was talking to him. And I asked him all the usual questions. You know, where are you from? He was from another state. And what do you do? And things like that. In the course of talking to him, uh, he had told me that he had heard a calling from God, a vision from God. And God had told him to go to India as a missionary. And so I was really, really happy because, you know, I love it when people talk about that. He had been working in the States, apparently, and God had spoken to him. God had given him, I believe it was a vision or a calling, and uh, God had spoken to him audibly and said, you are to drop everything you're doing and go to India as a missionary and preach the gospel, right? Great, right? That's great, right? Well, here's the thing. After an hour or two, that person left, and I spoke to my friend, his cousin, and I was very happy hearing that, uh, but he wasn't happy. So he told me some things. He said, first of all, uh, no one in our family is happy that our cousin has declared his plans to do that. First of all, that's the first thing you should know, Noble. The second thing was that this cousin, this relative of his, was always coming up with ideas like that, ill-advised, ill-planned, and everybody was saying, don't do this, but he would go off on his own and do these things and usually get himself into trouble. So once again, the family was saying to him, no, this is not probably not of God. You shouldn't be doing this, okay? And most important, he told me one thing. Uh, this relative of his, he had a wife and he had children. And he had mentioned to me, but his cousin clarified, he had said, I'm going to leave my wife and children back in the state that they live, and I'm going to go. And then when he left, his cousin, my friend, told me that, uh, uh, that his wife and children were very distraught about this. He had actually said my wife was unhappy about this. They were very unhappy, they were very distraught that he was going to leave them and travel to India for a year, two years, uh, uh, and just abandon them, right? And immediately I knew one thing. I knew one thing, that God had not called this man to be a missionary. Why? Because he was planning on abandoning his wife. He was planning on abandoning his children. How do we know that that is not God speaking to you? 1 Timothy 5.8. Uh, Paul's first epistle to Timothy, chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Timothy 5.8 says like this, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The Bible says you have to take care of your family, especially your immediate family. The Bible says you have to provide for them. So if you are an able-bodied person, if you are able to work, if you are able to provide, God has given you uh, a challenge to take care of your family. And anything you do... Uh, towards abandoning them is not of God. So immediately I knew that this man had not received a vision from God because he said the vision told him to abandon his wife and children and to go be a missionary. On the surface of it, it sounds great, but in reality, God had not spoken to him. Do you see how we use God's word as a standard? We use God's word as a standard to measure, just like we use the tape measure to measure the fridge and the door, we use God's word as a standard to measure visions and prophecy and sermons and messages. Always use God's word to measure all the other messages that you receive. God's word is reliable. Going back to 2 Timothy 3.16, it says like this, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, right? What Paul is saying to Timothy there is that God's word can be used as a standard. God's word is reliable. Um, go through it really quickly. Uh, we've spoken a couple of years ago. God's word can be used as a standard for measurement of your own life to know God's will. I've spoken about this before a couple of years ago. We say that the primary way that God reveals his will to us is through his word. 90% of God's will for you is found in the Bible. 
90% of God's will for you is found in the Bible. So if you want to measure your own life, if you want to use a, a, a standard to figure out what you should do, go to the scripture. God's will be, be, will be applied to your life. If you want to know the will of God, make sure you have thoroughly and completely completely examine the scriptures on the subject. God reveals his will in his word. Psalm 119, 105 says like this, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. God's word is constantly working in your life. Hebrews 4.12, a verse that we won't have time to go into, says the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul, spirit, joints, marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. When you read the word of God, God is using that as a standard to measure against your own life, your actions, your behaviors, your speech, even the thoughts of your mind and your heart. God is measuring you with his word. That's what happens when you read the word of God. It's a standard to test teachers and prophets. We talked about that earlier. It's a standard to test and discern the, uh, the doctrine of prophets and teachers. Uh, go home and read Deuteronomy 18, 17 to 20. Deuteronomy 18, uh, 17 to 20. Um, uh, when the prophet speaks something God has not commanded, God warns the people, that's not from me. Why? Because there's discrepancy between the word of God and what the God has spoken what the prophet has spoken. So God's word is being used as a standard against that prophet. Be careful anyone teaching anyone contrary to the word of God. Romans 16, 17 says like this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. You can use God's word as a standard for everyone around you, including those of your fellow believers in church. I have been in many churches, and I have seen many people, many Christians behave in very unchristian ways. And if you were to use the word of God to measure and to uh, against them, they would fall really short. So God's word can be used as a standard. Acts 17, 11, go home and read it. The people in Berea were considered more open-minded because they listened to Paul's message, but what did they do? They compared it with the scriptures. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. The Bereans were commended for this. As Paul and Silas were preaching, these were great men of God. What were they doing? They're saying, Paul's a great man of God. I accept everything. No, they're saying, is what Paul is saying matching what is found in the scripture? Does everybody understand? that we use scripture as a standard and so one of the most important spiritual disciplines that I can tell you as Sunday school uh, students and young people is to know the word of God to know proper doctrine to immerse yourself in the scripture to memorize scripture why because God's word is a standard I'm going to skip because we're running out of time and I want to go to the last point so we mentioned that God's word, uh, the Bible is God's word. The Bible speaks to us. We mentioned uh, that b- the Bible is inerrant. There are no mistakes in scripture. We mentioned that God's word is a standard. We can use it to compare against all other doctrines and words and messages and prophecies. And finally, the thing that I want to say, the most important point is this. The Bible is all about Jesus. The Bible is all about Jesus. I'll turn re- very quickly to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John says like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1, verses 1, the very first verse of the very first chapter of John's Gospel, he talks about the Word and the Word being with God. And then you skip down to verse 14. He says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John is equating the word with Jesus. Jesus is the word. He came from the father. He was there from the beginning. If you want to know who God is and know who he is and know his plan for you, all you have to do is to look at Jesus. And where do you find Jesus? You find him in the pages of the Bible. You find him in the pages of the Bible. In that same chapter, John chapter 1, in verse 18, it says like this, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. 
if you want to know God. Let me tell you, young people, many people say God is an enigma wrapped up in a mystery. You can never know God. He's so distant. I have no idea what he wants. I have no idea what he's saying to you. I'm going to end here, but let me just say and remember this, and I'm pleading to you with all of my heart. You can know God. You can know who God is. Just look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus. You will learn about God. You will learn about how much he loves you through the life of Jesus in the Bible. In uh, going back and using Psalm 119 as a reference, Psalm 119, the last verse that Anita read, Psalm 119, 8, it says like this, I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. I find that very interesting, that do not utterly forsake me. Why? For those of you in the fasting and prayer, a couple of weeks ago, we know what was the last words that Jesus uttered on the cross. What were the last words he said? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? What was Jesus doing? Many people think that he was crying out to Elijah because Eloi stands similar to uh, the sound of Elijah's name. Uh, many people think that he was crying out to Elijah because there was a belief in the last days when the Messiah comes that Elijah would come. But we know that Jesus was not crying out to Elijah. He was crying out to God. And what was he doing? He was reading scripture. Psalm 22, he was quoting scripture. Psalm 22, uh, verse 1, my my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far, so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and I'm not silent. Listen to me, young people. In your darkest moments, whenever you think that God has abandoned you, when God has given up on you, no, God has not given up on you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you, and there is no greater moment where you can identify with him, where he can identify identify with you than his last words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was not saying God forsook him. He was quoting scripture for us. Why? Because Psalm 22 is a verse of hope. Psalm 22 is a verse of hope. The psalmist changes his tune later on in the chapter. He has not despised or disdained, disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry from help. I have to end here because we are well over time, but I want you to know that God loves you dearly, and God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Why? Because the Bible it says self testifies to that John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life as the worship team com comes forward I will close I want to, you to know that the Bible is all about Jesus every page is all about Jesus from the very first book where Jesus is the creator where he's the seed of the woman to the uh, book of Exodus where he's the Passover lamb to Deuteronomy where he's the law, he's the high priest, uh, to Psalms where he's the good shepherd, to the Song of Solomon where he's the lover and he's the bridegroom, to Matthew where he's the Messiah, to Luke where he's the son of man, to John where he's the son of God, to Revelation where he is the soon and coming king. The Bible is all about Jesus. In those darkest moments when you don't know if God has turned his face against you, you can read the words of the Bible and see that God's love you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. Every page in every book is all about Jesus. The Bible is about Jesus. He is the living word. He is the logos made the rhema. He is the living word made incarnate. There's a very disturbing poem I heard years ago and the first time I heard it uh, it struck me so much that I still remember it to this day. Um, it was in a book by Phil Yancey probably know about it. It goes like this. Listen carefully to the narrator in the poem. He says like this, but God is up in heaven and he doesn't do a thing with a million angels watching and they never move a wing. It's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me. I said to the carpenter hanging on the tree. The narrator doesn't realize it and he's disdaining God. He's saying God doesn't care. And he's telling the person on the tree who's hanging on the cross, you know, they are to crucify God instead of you and me, not realizing that it was God himself hanging on the cross. God loves you very much, young people. I don't want you to forget that. God loves you very much. Every page of every word of every scripture, uh, God loves you.
read the Bible, memorize scripture, apply it to your life, and know one thing, the word of God is true, and the Bible is the truth, and Jesus loves you because the Bible proclaims it. As the old children's song says, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. May God bless you with these words.